Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Claudia Alvarez. I am the project manager for START at Children and Family Futures. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Please do not use your computer mic and speaker option. The phone lines will be muted to reduce feedback and room noise and will be open during the roll call and discussion portions of the webinar. All presentation materials are available for download on Adobe Connect under the files pod located on the left-hand side of your screen. These documents will also be placed on the Ohio Start Dropbox. We will also be sending out the recorded link to this webinar next week along with the materials covered. Questions will be answered throughout the presentation as time allows via the chat box pod located in the middle of your screen. We will also address questions during Q&A break. Some questions may require a longer explanation or discussion, so these may be, may be placed on the parking lot and addressed at a later time. All questions and answers will be compiled into a Q&A document and placed on the Ohio Start Dropbox. We anticipate lots of follow-up on upcoming calls. So in other words, all answers will be answered eventually. With that, I'll turn it over to Marla Himmiger, Program Manager with Ohio Start. Marla, I hope I didn't butcher your name. You're good. Good morning, everybody. I hear a lot of dings, but not seeing a lot of people that are online also. So I encourage you not only to listen by phone, but make sure that you're logging in um, to the webinar also so you can see all the slides. Uh, we are excited to have part two today of Child and Family Futures is talking about the intersection with behavioral health and, and uh, start. And we know this is a, a very important thing that everybody needs to, it's, it's a huge part of Ohio Start and of Start off in general also. So um, we'll be able, you can have uh, from the February call, those are all available. We sent that out. Um, we, I think we've already also already made information available on the Dropbox, but please, we encourage you to, if you aren't able to both be on today, we, as uh, Claudia said, we'll also be sending out the recording of this. So we encourage you to get together with behavioral health and child welfare and listen to these together. Um, maybe it's part of a brown bag or something. Um, I do want to go through um, a roll call here and I will do it by county. So uh, if you have yourself on mute, if you take yourself off to answer, that would be great. Good morning. Richland. That's me. I'm here from Richland. Good morning. Seneca. I already have Star. I see we have people from Summit. And Trumbull. Trumbull's here. Good morning. Did, um, was there anyone that's on that didn't call out that they're on from a county? Any counties that we missed? Morrow County is on here. Good morning, Morrow. Good morning. Okay, again, if you can get on the computer, that's great, but we also appreciate you being on by phone. Um, and if everybody can remember, we're going to mute the line. Um, we will open them up for later for questions. Um, but today we're also going to hear from our child, from um, Children and Family Futures, our TA team that we're working with. It's part of um, the National START program. And our team is Tina Willauer, who's the program director, Dr. Ruth Hubner, who's our evaluator, um, Jennifer Foley, who's our, our senior program associate, uh, Lynn Posey, our secret senior program associate, and Christina Killen, who's a program associate also. Um, Tina and Jennifer and Christina, many of you just saw last week uh, when we had our meetings and our Foundation 3 training for Cohort 2. Um, Lynn is our behavioral health guru for us uh, for start, and um, she also led the webinar that we did in February, and she'll be leading it again today. 
Um, Fawn and Tina both have children a little bit under the weather and uh, will not be able to join us today, but we um, will miss them, but we will make sure that we follow up with them on things too so they're kept up. And again, this is being recorded and we will make the recording available. Again, if you are able to get online, there are files down in the left-hand corner of your screen that you can also download, and we will add those to Dropbox. Um, Lynn, I think I'd like to turn it over to you now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marla. Um, that was a, a great welcome. I feel like I've been promoted um, to, to Guru. Thank you. That was fun. Um, so, so, yeah, I'm really glad to uh, be with you guys today um, to talk some more about behavioral health. Um, and I'm really glad that the rest of our team, we miss Tina today, but glad that um, Jen and Christina and Claudia could be with us today. So um, just a, a reminder about all the different initiatives that Children and Family Futures uh, covers. Um, we work in all different areas. I think uh, those of you who have counties with uh, family recovery courts are probably familiar with our um, TA in that area. Um, and START is part of the, the family of, of uh, initiatives. We're really happy to be there. Um, so we just have a, a quick polling question for you guys about what system you work for. So those of you who are able to be on the uh, online on the webinar, um, the poll is up. And if you'll uh, go on and respond to that, uh, we're just curious about our, do you work in the uh, substance use or mental health disorder treatment system or in the child welfare system. So I see the results are, are coming in. Um, we kind of designed the first webinar on the on February 21st to be uh, geared towards behavioral health providers and that today is kind of geared more towards child welfare providers. Um, we're happy to have both, obviously, to have everybody because it's a collaborative project. But, um, but nice to see. It looks like we've got, um, well, it looks like a 100% uh, child welfare. So it looks like we have the, the right audience with us today. So, um, so great. Thanks. And, of course, sorry for those of you who are on the phone but not able to be on the uh, Adobe Connect that you weren't able to, to see or participate in that polling question. But you'll still be able to participate in the conversation. Um, we're really hoping that today is going to be more uh, conversational than the the last webinar was very uh, very didactic. We it was all um, teaching, uh, you know, and it was straight out of the uh, manual and um, chapter five of the manual that or chapter eight that we made available for you guys. Today is based on chapter five out of the Start Implementation Manual, um, but it's also uh, you know, designed to be more of a of a conversation. So I'll present some information, and then we'll um, and then we'll have a chance to talk together about how we can, uh, you know, ideas that you guys might have, uh, quandaries you might uh, be in, and you know, whatever questions, so that we can learn from each other because um, we're all part of a learning community together. So. All right, so we're going to be talking about uh, engaging treatment providers, um, substance use disorder and mental health treatment providers. And uh, even though we say that START is a child welfare-based intervention because it works with families in the child welfare system, it can't be implemented, obviously, without strong partnerships with behavioral health, both at the state level and at the local level. Um, and knowing that, uh, that Fawn and Marla are working at the state level, with the um, state folks to, to uh, help lead this initiative and how important that is, and, uh, and that you guys are working at your local level to make the initiative successful as well. Um, and the success of START depends on strong services. And so part of our work is to build on and improve the array of services uh, and the quality of services available um, for families in each community. Um, so, and I'm sure that you guys probably have ideas about what improvements might look like um, in your own community. Um, and as Tina likes to say, or, you know, sorry she can't be with us today, but as she likes to say, there's no more business as usual when it comes to START. 
Um, so we all have to have a willingness to, to change practice when it's needed, both on the child welfare end and on the treatment end. So what are we going to be asking of the treatment providers that we're working with? And I know that some of you, uh, your initiative is already rolling and you're you know, seeing families and you're, you've already engaged treatment providers, maybe all the treatment providers who are going to be involved in your project, whereas others of you are just getting started. And so you're just now thinking about, you know, okay, well, how does this work and which providers do we reach out to and what are we asking of them? And so uh, what I'm going to be presenting to you today is some basic information about what we are asking of treatment providers. And then we'll get into, you know, well, how do we, you know, ask that of them? How do we engage them? So the things that we're uh, asking them are to help us meet our time frames, um, to participate in meetings with us, to have uh, in pretty intensive communication uh, with us, some reporting and data, and then possibly drug testing, um, depending on how you have that set up in your own system. So we're going to begin by talking about the start time frame. And of course, those time frames are represented in our start timeline um, and how they apply to behavioral health providers. Um, and I think a lot of you were at the, uh, the start trainings that happened last week and were probably exposed to the, an, an updated uh, timeline for Ohio um, because it, it looks like you guys have adopted the national um, timeframes, the ones that were tested and written up in the manual and that sort of thing, which is wonderful, knowing, of course, that it, it's a, you know, it takes time to, you know, make a, a transition and that it, it takes time to, to meet the, the timeframe. So, and that's what we're all working here on together. So, um, so I'm going to ask Christina uh, to do a quick walkthrough of the timeline for us for those who, who haven't seen it, but also maybe as a, a reminder for those who have seen it. So, Christina. Great. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, one thing to keep in mind while you're looking at this timeline is that the days are going to be in calendar days versus business days. So, that um, accounts for um, some of the changes that you may um, recognize from the previous timeline to the 38-day timeline. I'm just going to walk through it really fast with you, starting there at the beginning with day one. So day one is going to be when the child abuse or neglect report is screened in by PCSA. And then moving into that yellow box, you're going to see that what we are hoping to do is to identify eligible families um, for START within 24 hours to 14 days. And the PCSA PCSA worker is going to be using the UNCOPE um, to determine that eligibility. And then once they determine that a START family is eligible, they're going to make that referral over to the START team within four days. And during that time period in that green box, you're going to see that they will be scheduling and conducting the initial shared decision-making meeting. And that's the meeting where the START team um, it's going to be introduced with the family, so they're going to meet their start caseworker, and they're also going to meet their family peer mentor. And then that start caseworker is going to get the signatures for the release of information um, for the family to participate in the program. And then within four days of that shared decision-making meeting, moving to that purple box-ish, um, the weekly face-to-face -face visits um, are going to begin to happen from that start caseworker as well as the family peer mentor. And then the treatment provider is going to meet with the parents to do their substance use mental health assessment. And then we're also going to ask that they complete that ACE screening and that any referrals that are needed for treatment to be made. Then within one day of that shared decision-making meeting, um, moving to that orange box, we're going to um, ask that the assessment or that clinician gives verbal recommendations um, to the parents as well as to PCSA and that referrals are made to treatment. We also ask that written treatment recommendations are given to PCSA within five days. Then moving into that purple, bluish colored box, within three days of that treatment referral, the parents will begin the intensive substance use disorder treatment. So they're gonna begin treatment at the level of need um, for that parent. And then within 12 days of beginning that treatment, 
Um, we're asking that the parents receive four separate treatment sessions within that 12 days. And then at the end of the 38 days, by the time we reach 38 days, um, we want to have a family team meeting to really look at aligning the case plan with the treatment plan. And then also during this time frame, within 30 days of that start referral, the child trauma screening will be done um, to make sure that we get the kiddos the services that they need as well. Okay, Lynn, I'm going to turn back over. Thank you, Christina. I appreciate you uh, going over uh, the timeline with everybody. And, um, and thinking about uh, what part of the timeline it fits for the behavioral health providers that we're working with or engaging. Um, and so, uh, so here we have kind of a snapshot of the section of the timeline that applies to behavioral health. And as you can see, it's almost the entire timeline right, that we're asking behavioral health providers to get involved um, very early on at that very first shared decision-making meeting um, that happens, you know, as soon as that case gets referred over to start and you have that shared decision-making meeting. Um, and then they're involved, you know, they're, it has to be that collaborative effort between uh, behavioral health and child welfare that gets us, uh, you know, the, the quick access. Um, but, you know, thinking particularly in this webinar about specifically what is it we're asking of, uh, of behavioral health and then and how do we get that to, to happen um, so that we can get closer and closer to meeting the time frame. Okay, so, so thinking about the time frames, what are the things that we're asking of, uh, of providers? Um, so as you're talking with them, as you're engaging them, you're going to be, you're, you'll want to tell them that quick access to treatment is essential to this model and that it begins with being a part of that shared decision-making meeting and then doing the behavioral health assessment. Um, then you're going to tell them that we're asking for verbal treatment recommendations um, that are reported to child welfare and the family um, that same day or the next day as the assessment um, so that child welfare can reinforce the plan with the client. Um, and because clear communication is so important, within five days of the assessment, we're asking for those written treatment recommendations to be shared. Um, and, of course, those written treatment recommendations can go, you know, into the child welfare uh, chart, you know, they, and then you'll be making sure that they fit with the child welfare case plan and that sort of thing. Um, and treatment recommendations should include services to address substance use disorders, co-occurring mental health, and trauma. Um, all of those are very important. Um, and then the treatment for start clients generally needs to be intense. And of course, it's based on the level of care that's, that is recommended based on their assessment and individualized treatment plan um, using a level of care system such as ASAM or LOCUS. Um, I, I think in Ohio, you guys use the ASAM, um, which is a wonderful uh, decision-making tool um, to help determine what level of care uh, a client is in need of. Um, and some clients are going to require things like detoxification and then uh, transfer to intensive treatment. <clears throat> and in order to ensure that clients move quickly into those intensive services that they need for the timeline, think about asking the treatment provider to provide a minimum of those four outpatient appointments that Christina was talking about during the first two weeks following the assessment. So in other words, um, if they go directly into intensive treatment, they're going to meet the time frames uh, right away. If you're in detox or in a residential program or intensive outpatient, of course, you're going to have at least two sessions in those first two weeks. But sometimes there's a wait for a slot. Um, sometimes uh, it could be that you're, you know, trying to find the right uh, treatment for somebody. And so we're asking the provider to see them at least twice a week for the first two weeks until they get into whatever is required. Um, and there's a lot more information about treatment recommendations in the uh, webinar from February 21st. So if you are interested to hear more about that uh, or want to, you know, listen to that with your treatment providers, 
that could be a good way to get everybody up to speed. So, um, so you'll want to have a representative from the treatment provider uh, participating in your uh, family team meetings or shared decision-making meetings, along with child welfare and the family and other partners and support. Um, so these family team meetings are the forum to address any kind of treatment recommendations and progress, relapse issues, et cetera. Um, that should sound really familiar to you guys. And you might be wondering, you know, gosh, how do we how do we get them there? Is that something that they you know will come to? Is it something that they're they're paid to do? Um, and we'll come back to that question in, here in a moment. Um, so the uh, another thing that you might be asking of of treatment providers in terms of timeframes is that if they're helping you with drug tests, that the results are uh, back in a an amount of time that fits. For, uh, for your child welfare needs and that the results are shared with child welfare immediately so that you can do safety checks if needed um, and follow up with, you know, any needed uh, changes or services or that sort of thing. So, so okay, so how, how can providers make all this happen? Um, coming to those meetings, doing quick assessments, getting quick access to treatment, um, one way that several jurisdictions have used um, is for the, pro the treatment provider, at least one, uh, maybe your main treatment partner, to employ a point person. Um, they're sometimes called a treatment coordinator or a service coordinator. And they would come to that initial safety meeting. They would conduct that first assessment, um, often on the very first day, uh, right after the your decision-making meeting, and then they would coordinate the needed services. So, uh, so this is basically, you know, behavioral health case management, identifying the behavioral health needs, finding treatment resources, linking clients with services through referrals and warm handoffs, monitoring progress and services, and then making adjustments as needed. Sometimes they have to reassess if a client is not doing well in treatment or they're ready to step down to a different level of care. And then that cycle of identification and linkage and monitoring repeats um, because we don't give up on families, right? And so the service coordination or whoever does the service coordination has to be someone with a lot of perseverance, um, kind of like the, the workers and the mentors have to have. So we'll come back to this idea about um, service coordination here in a, a little bit and have a chance to do some discussion. So, so I always like to um, come back to what we call the money shot, just kind of as a reminder of why are we doing all this again? <laughs> why are we trying to, to meet these time frames? Um, and that's because START is based on evidence that quick access makes a difference to outcomes, of course. And our own research on START shows a direct correlation between fidelity to the quick access timeframes and better outcomes for children and mothers and fathers. So you can see as the red line goes down, how many days it takes to get those first five treatment sessions, our success rates with children staying with their parents and how moms are doing and how dads are doing. Um, go up and up. And you'll also notice it took, you know, three years of implementation to get to that point where we were meeting the, the time frames that quickly. So um, that always gives me a little bit of hope, too, that we'll get there, but sometimes it can take a minute. And why is it that it, that it can take some time? Well, if, if you think about how what it takes to implement a new initiative. Um, there's a whole science behind it. Um, it's called implementation science. Um, and they say that it can take two to four years to reach fidelity to a, a new model that you're doing. Um, and you, know, you think about all the things that have to be put into place in order to make that happen. Um, during that two to four years, you should begin seeing some really positive things happening and some, some really nice outcomes. Um, but getting the really good, you know, outcomes, the uh, the ones you're really shooting for, will come once you've reached fidelity to the model. So, so it takes some time to achieve the time frame. It takes collaboration, um, which can be a lot of work, right? Um, for instance, you might find that you need to build relationships with people from agencies you've never spoken to before now, or that you have a negative impression of. Um, you might find that they have a negative impression of your agency. Um, we, we've run across that um, in several jurisdictions. 
Um, maybe not at first, but after a while, the truth comes out. Um, and then you're going to be asking them to work together with you on this project, which will require you to develop protocols together. You might tip away at the protocols for a while, um, and let alone at following the protocols. Um, so that might take a minute. And then you might find that some of the services that your clients need just aren't available um, in your community. And so part of your collaborative project might include developing new services. So we're going to talk about all three of these important areas today. Uh, some communities might say that they have everything already in place, or at least that they can get there with just a few tweaks. But other communities might feel like they're miles away from being able to do the model with fidelity. Um, and wherever you are, we're here to work with you. Um, and together, we'll work towards model fidelity and improving outcomes for families. Um, so today, we'll be sharing some information with you, and then uh, we want to hear from you guys about what your ideas and your challenges are. So here's our first uh, opportunity to have some discussion um, about the topic of service coordination. Um, and we really want to hear from you guys um, who does the, the service coordination for you all. Um, and what we mean by that is uh, doing that assessment, attending family team meetings, linking uh, clients with services, um, and uh, you know, monitoring how the, the services are going. And it could be that you have the different people play different, you know, roles in making um, service coordination happen. So, um, so I'll let you know that in Kentucky, they, uh, they decided that they needed um, to hire service coordinators. So it's an actual position um, in the behavioral health system. Um, and that person is assigned to the task of doing the assessments, and then doing all that behavioral health case management um, to make sure that families are getting the services that they needed. Um, and I know from talking with Tina that in where START originated in Cleveland, they, um, they didn't need to have the service coordinators. They had an assessment um, center that could do quick assessments and give treatment recommendations, and then the worker and the mentor ran with the recommendations and helped the client get into the services that they needed. And then if a reassessment was needed, they could go back to the assessment center. Not everybody has an assessment center. No place in Kentucky had an assessment center. Um, and I'm wondering, um, Christina, I, I'm, I'm calling on you again. Would you care to say how um, Indiana set this up? What did they do for service coordination? Mm -hmm. So our START program, we partnered with our community mental health centers as well, and we had what we called a treatment coordinator, and that individual was a licensed therapist, and she attended all of our shared decision-making meetings. She did that initial assessment for us, as well as making those treatment recommendations, and she would provide that individual counseling if that was needed as well. Um, and then she would have conversations with the other clinicians in her agency and gather that information from the group leaders and other um, individual therapists and would um, ensure that we got that information on a weekly basis through those um, weekly treatment reports, as well as um, just making sure that, you know, there was conversations going on with our, our family mentor and our start caseworker. And we did that through, um, because our community mental health centers had a variety of services they could bill towards Medicaid. Um, those services that she completed, the majority of them did get billed towards Medicaid. And then just like in um, Cleveland, we um, then supplemented her salary with that as well. That makes sense. Thanks, Christina. That's really, that's really helpful. So, and I think everybody's phone line should be unmuted now who's, who's on the call. And we'd really like to hear from you guys. Um, how are you doing service coordination now? Or if you're just setting up your program, how are you thinking it might work for your county? This is Terry from Athens. And, and we do, you know, we do that um, in Athens where we have somebody designated as the um, kind of the start coordinator that um, works very closely with the peers, but also with the referrals, managing the referrals as they come in and seeing that they're linked. And um, 
also providing, you know, providing direct service. But I don't, I mean, to me, that's a model that, you know, we need to have the funding in place to replicate. We, we're not necessarily allowed to do that in other counties, but it's vital, I think, you know, I, um, it's vitally important. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you said that, Carrie. I, I feel like it's a really important role, too, yeah, however it is that that gets um, pieced together. But, yeah. Good. How, you know, about, we, how about, uh, oh, go ahead. Well, I mean, we, you know, obviously it's a productive position where there is some expectation under the, in the behavioral health that the person earns their keep and does some billing. But we do, you know, Athens County Children's Services has allowed us to use a little bit of the start money to cover some of her unbillable time so that she can have her hands on all of this. And that's, you know, I think that it's hard to do that without having a little bit of wiggle room in the behavioral health world, you know, that, that we didn't design, but that's how it exists. You know, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Can you say some about what what part of her role you use the start funds for? Well, the, the, the coordination, receiving, you know, receiving the referrals, um, kind of, you know, supervising the peers, being there to support them as well. Um, but just, you know, seeing that things are running smoothly. Of course, she attends all of the meetings with children's services, all the care coordination, um, as many of the family team meetings, if that makes sense. But just the oversight of making sure that the linkage is happening um, in a timely manner is, is important. Nice, nice. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how about others? Or other counties setting this up? So this is Rachel with Richland County. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. I guess I, I would have a question and we're, you know, just getting this rolling and it's a learning curve for everybody over here, I think. Um, but I, it's my understanding that some of those service coordinator um, responsibilities, um, are those not some of the things that the peer mentors could be doing, like the linkage piece and whatnot? That's a great question. Yeah, and in some places, the uh, family mentors or the uh, even the workers, you know, help with those linkages, mm -hmm. the services. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yes, that, that is true in some places that that's how that works. Um, and okay, I think so you know, each county kind of figures out what makes sense for them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I guess like the important piece then would to be able to go, you know, what is in your scope of practice kind of thing and then how gray is that area or are these fine lines, where do those fall kind of things, right? Does that make sense? Yes, that does make sense. Um, and also to think about are there, part, like, are there, would there be times when you would need the behavioral health provider to be, you know, present for a, mm -hmm. uh, for a family team meeting or a shared decision making right. meeting or whoever's doing that assessment, that sort of thing. So, okay. so that might be a time when you would, you know, want to make sure that you, you know, have that behavioral health person on hand. Yeah, but perhaps the vintage piece, the services, maybe the family mentors take care of. So, okay. um, and you know, it really, sometimes it depends on caseload size, too. Um, we found in Kentucky where the caseload size was, you know, 12 to 15, that the family mentors didn't necessarily have time to do a lot of the uh, linkage. Now, they do some of it, but the service coordinators do quite a bit of it as well, kind of like in Indiana. So, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, sure. How about others? Other thoughts or how you've got it set up? Did it disconnect? I don't know. I thought I had to know somebody else back in out. Hey, good morning, everyone. This is uh, Thomas P. calling from Franklin. Thomas. Hey, how's it going? Um, myself, Sammy, and Jason, we were sitting here just, just dialoguing and, and talking about um, how fortunate we are up here with um, in Franklin County and working with um, with Eden Counseling Centers um, with our family peer mentor, how the peer mentor 
and how also the case manager from um, Franklin County are are teamed at the hip, how they get out there and um, um, get out there to the families and, and, and talk with them and assess the needs. And um, what we're really fortunate is, is with our family peer mentor being right there to say, hey, let's go ahead and make an immediate call. Let's go ahead and get them uh, linked up. And um, we're getting clients in, you know, 24, 48 hours for that initial appointment. Um, so I think that the, the commitment um, from um, Franklin County and, and also the commitment from Eden Counseling Centers to say that, hey, um, the Ohio Star program is going to be a priority. Um, these clients um, are at the top of the list um, to be able to get them in in that 24, 48-hour period um, has really made a huge difference. Um, and what it does is uh, eliminates those barriers because we know in the past, a lot of times clients would have to wait um, two and three weeks for an appointment, and, um, and we don't want to play that type of game with folks. We just want to make sure that, that they're able to start getting the services um, that they need as quick as possible. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. So, Thomas, I'm going to come back to you um, a little later on today, too, to, to ask about how you were able to, to get that negotiated with them. Sure, um, sure. So, yeah, cool. So, thank you. Got it, you got it. So, it sounds you got it. like it's... Go ahead. You got to excuse me just for a hot second. I got to say, um, although we don't know each other, but I got to say hello to Terry um, down there in Athens because um, I'm a, I'm a OU Bobcat. So anytime I get a chance to shout out somebody from Athens, I got to do that. Yay, Bobcat. <laughs> <laughs> we have a new basketball coach. Did you see that? Yeah, hey, I, I know. Hey, believe me, I'm, I'm following everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. So, so it sounds like so far we've got kind of a mix of some some places maybe have a service coordinator and they're using some of their start funds to help support that uh, position. In some places, it's the, maybe thinking that the family per mentor will do a lot of the uh, linkages for services. And in some places, it sounds like it's a mix of the uh, behavioral health case manager and the family per mentor. Anybody else want to weigh in? Lynn, this is Marla, and I just want to say in Ohio, with Ohio START, one of the issues has been the tr in terms of our funding, that we can't use VOCA funds for recovery services. We can, the SOAR fund can be used for that. So I think that may be something that um, people haven't, haven't figured out all of that yet, too. So that could be part of that. Oh, could you say some more about that, Marla? I'm, I'm not familiar with the different restrictions. VOCA funds are for victim services and can't be used for uh, recovery services. So while, you know, we, would, we think the service coordination is great, the most service coordination I think we have going on with the VOCA funding has to do with our family care mentors because our behavior, for the most part, not everybody, but most counties, the uh, family care mentors are hired through behavioral health. So that's where some of that coordination comes in between um, working with the family care mentors. So because of that, but our SOAR funding, the state opioid response funding, um, that we also gave counties this year could be used for services like that. And I just don't know that a lot of counties have chosen to use the funding that way. And again, we, you know, going forward, we don't know how that could change with the new budget, but that's definitely something we can look at going forward and maybe um, put out some guidance of where that might be able to fall. But we encourage our behavioral health partners, if there's any way that they could help support this in any way, that would be a really good thing to do. And That's always talk it. to your Adam, always talk to your Adam board about it too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you, Marla. That was, that was helpful to me. I, I bet, I bet it was helpful to some other folks on the phone too. So good. Okay. Anybody else want to weigh in? All right. I think that was a, a, a good and helpful discussion so far. So, okay, so uh, so we'll mute the lines again, and then um, we'll uh, unmute when we get to the next uh, discussion. So, um, so thinking about, here's the second thing that I mentioned that we're asking our treatment providers for, and that's participating in meetings. 
Um, you know, there's, you know, lots and lots of meetings um, with START at, at various levels. Um, so we're asking them to participate in steering meetings. Um, so those would be for the, you know, treatment directors and managers, you know, folks who are working with policy and systems issues. Um, so do you invite all of your treatment providers to your steering meetings? Um, well, that depends. Um, you can always talk that over with your TA provider if you're, you know, wondering who all to include in your meeting. Um, one rule of thumb is that if you have a contract or an agreement with a provider for start services, then they should be invited to the steering meetings, obviously. Um, and we'll talk a mo more about agreements here in a few minutes. Um, we can also ask treatment providers to participate in monthly direct line meetings. Um, those are the ones that deal with systems issues or with, uh, with service issues directly related to our start participants. So if your families are served by an agency, you should invite them, right, um, to your direct line meetings. If there is a uh, contract or an agreement, then the uh, program directors and supervisors managers should be invited to participate in periodic contract monitoring meetings as well. Um, I think that's kind of kind of obvious, but it's you know part of what you do just to make sure that your uh, contract is running smoothly. So will everybody come every time? To your meetings? Well, no, not necessarily. Um, some will only come occasionally. Um, sometimes you have to go to them for the meeting. Uh, the meetings are a vehicle for collaboration, but we're asking for more than just attendance, aren't we? Um, we want to be working together to better serve our families. Um, if you have uh, any questions about, well, what should we put on our agendas and who should be invited and that sort of thing, um, you know, feel free to reach out to your change liaison. Um, I know uh, uh, Jen Foley and Christina have uh, lots of ideas that they can share with you. Um, I'm sure that uh, Marla does as well. All right, so the third thing that we're asking of treatment providers in START is communication, um, and in several different ways. Uh, one is those written weekly progress updates that Christina referenced. Um, these are just basic, short uh, reports about participation in treatment, progress in treatment, um, drug testing results, if they're uh, doing drug testing, um, that sort of thing. Uh, we're also asking for at least weekly verbal um, communication between the treatment provider, and it could be with the, the service coordinator, with the, uh, the worker, with the uh, family peer mentor, um, but we're, you know, talking with them a lot, uh, you know, just checking in. And that could be if they're in residential or if they're in the IOP or, or whatever. You probably find yourself talking to each other all the time. Um, but it's good to let providers know up front, you know, this is part of what we're asking of you is lots of communication. Um, another thing is immediate notification if there's relapse or safety concerns. So if they are doing um, drug testing, and there's a positive that we would want that positive result uh, sent immediately uh, over. And, and you guys would, you know, figure out together, you know, well, how do the results come? Do you, are you, do you have access to the website or do they email them or, you know, how, whatever that might be. But the, the point is that the notification needs to be immediate. Um, and then if they are doing um, drug test results that the, or drug tests, that the results be shared um, when they're received. Um, because that's important, right, for child welfare to be able to do the um, the safety checks that they need to do as we're trying to, to keep kids in the home. Um, so these are important things to tell um, providers about up front. Um, so I want to share um, just some quotes with you. This is from our uh, START providers in Kentucky about the value of communication. Um, and one of them said to us, uh, in the beginning, when we knew that we had to have weekly contact with the social workers, we would be rolling our eyes. In the past, there hadn't been a lot of trust in our relationships. Now, I don't know if that's true in your, you know, community or not, um, but we, we found that to be true um, in Kentucky, also in, uh, in Indiana where we were working. Um, we're starting to find that in, uh, in Maryland as well. Um, another person said, Really knowing the family situation of the client changed our treatment practices. 
the information and insight given by the mentor helped us to adapt better practices. Um, so, so as you can see from the two quotes, it's possible that at the beginning, they weren't really crazy about the idea of that much communication, but over time, they found that they really came to value it. So, uh, so here's another opportunity for discussion. Um, so we'll unmute the phones again. Um, and this time, what I'd like to uh, ask about you guys is if you get weekly written reports, from treatment providers, or if, you're, if you are a treatment provider, do you provide weekly a written report? Um, and also thinking about what's the value of having a, a written report? So the line should be open if anybody wants to share. The value in the week and we have weekly content. This is Kara from Fairfield County. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hey, Kara. Hi there. So we used to do um, monthly provider reports with um, our providers and our peer mentors would be the ones who would actually um, get those reports from the counselors. Um, but then we kind of saw that our peer mentor might work for one um, agency, but the counselor might work for another um, agency. So we're kind of having trouble getting the reports on a monthly basis. Um, so at this point, our caseworkers are just reaching out to the counselors um, often. I mean, we're seeing them often like at um, family court and state court status hearings. They come to meetings. Um, so I think that just that verbal communication and email communication that we're having often has kind of taken the place of um, those monthly written or weekly written reports. And I, at this point, I think we're finding that it's okay that we don't have them, the written report. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so, so you're getting the communication, but maybe not necessarily that they're writing it down for you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I know uh, I, I talked with Tina some about, you know, where, how do the weekly reports get started in, that, in Cleveland? And she said that it, it, it actually was an agreement with the providers that there, that it was a way that the providers could stay out of court. It, you know, that the judges said it was okay as long as there was a written report from the provider that, you know, that then the child welfare worker could include in their court report that that was adequate and it would help them stay out of court. I'm wondering if you've seen anything like that or if that's an issue for you guys in this field. Um, I don't believe it's something that's in our agreement currently, and I, I don't think that we could keep them out of court with that report because they come specifically, I think there is an agreement like between state court and family court that they actually come to those status hearings. So I don't think I don't think that would help them stay out of court on our end. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, good. Well, thanks for sharing. How about others? Are you getting written reports or weekly, monthly? or verbal? In Athens, we, you know, um, Integrated provides the monthly report, and that gets done, um, you know, the peer mentors do one, and the counselors do one. So, it, you know, anybody who's working with the family will do one. Um, we do not do them weekly. Um, that seems that seems like a tough task, though we do have weekly, um, you know, we're in contact um, throughout the week with, with CPS. So I think the communication, which is key, is is pretty strong. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, good. Well, and, you know, and in most settings, I, I know, too, that the family peer mentor would probably be entering contacts into the child welfare system, possibly. I don't know if you guys are doing that in, in Ohio, but um, yeah, since the uh, family mentor would be, you know, based in the child welfare system and, you know, partnered with the worker, so any contacts that they made would uh, would need to be entered uh, into the system. So it might be kind of what you're, what you're talking about uh, for Athens. So yeah, so it sounds like a lot frequent contacts. That's, uh, that's really key. Um, cool. Any, anybody else? Yeah, this is Brachelle again with Richland County. Um, so 
what is interesting for me is that I'm originally based at Family Life Counseling. I've been doing the substance abuse counseling there for a couple of years now. And so I'm shifting, in, and now I'm based at Richland County Children's Services under a peer mentor role. Um, so it's kind of a transition for me. Um, but I will say that, you know, Family Life does send weekly um, progress reports and such to the clients referring entities every week. Um, now, obviously, that's just one behavioral health um, agency that I'm talking about, but um, I know that, you know, their plan is to continue doing that with the Ohio Start families as well. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, good, good. Um, yeah, and I know sometimes it's easier to get weekly reports from some providers than it is from others. Um, so, uh, yeah, sometimes it, it's something you have to keep, keep asking for or, or, or that sort of thing. Or, you know, sometimes if you can't get that weekly report, um, you know, sometimes the staff, you know, have that verbal communication and then, you know, record the information themselves. So, right. yeah, so that's another, yeah, yeah. Um, there are a couple of examples of weekly report, uh, weekly reports if you guys want to look at them. They're on the uh, lower left-hand corner of your screen if you're on the Adobe Connect. Um, and if not, I think all the handouts will be available on the Dropbox afterwards. But um, so there's two uh, different ones uh, that you can look at for that, so in case you're, you're curious about it. Good. Anything else, Marla? Is there anything you want to add about uh, weekly reports or communication? With just so everybody, um, in Ohio, what we do have set up is, for the most part, family peer mentors are not able to answer into SACWIS, which is our child welfare information system, but they do enter, like, their weekly reports our, their vi weekly visits into our needs portal, which is part of our evaluation um, where we collect all that information. So that information is getting in, put in through the needs portal, so it's available to the child welfare agencies also. So that's how we're collecting it from the family peer mentors. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, that's good. Uh, knowing how important that information is for, for child welfare, especially if you're trying to establish that, you know, you've met reasonable efforts and, and that sort of thing. So, so okay. Absolutely. Yeah, good. Okay. Well, um, well let's, let's keep rolling. Um, so the, I, the phones will be uh, muted until we get to our next uh, discussion question here in a minute. Um, okay, so the fourth thing that we're going to be asking of treatment providers, um, so as you're meeting with them or engaging a new provider or, you know, moving to, you know, set up an agreement with them, uh, you're, you know, going to be talking with them about uh, reporting and data. Um, for instance, because quick access to treatment is, is so important and it's tracked for evaluation purposes, um, they might be asked to uh, – you know, as they're doing the ACEs uh, questionnaire on start referrals to report those uh, results back to child welfare, that sort of thing. Um, and then the, when there's contracts, uh, they'll be, you know, asked to submit expenditures and uh, uh, related to implementing the, the treatment program. So, so just a word about that. And then the fifth thing um, is, is drug testing that we might be asking of treatment providers, depending. Um, and, you know, each county, I think, differs in terms of who collects the samples and how that works. Um, and we talked more about drug testing in the uh, last uh, presentation. Um, so, but, so I won't, you know, go into a lot of that here. Um, but just uh, knowing that if, if they're going to be doing the samples, that we're talking with them about uh, guidelines for sample collection and confirmation and then how the uh, test results are communicated. Um, and then, of course, if child welfare is doing the test uh, or a third party or whatever, that we'd want to be talking with a provider about, um, you know, about sharing the results with them so that they can inform um, treatment planning uh, and how, you know, so they have that information about how the, how the client is responding to treatment. 
So, uh, so we'd be providing those results back to them pretty quickly. All right, so those are all the things that we're asking uh, of our providers or the general things that we're asking of our providers. Um, and so now we're going to think about how do we engage treatment providers? Um, so this is, these are just kind of tips and ideas for you. Um, and we want to start with a polling question um, about how many providers are currently working in your START collaborative. Um, so we'll pull up this uh, polling question for those who are on the Adobe Connect. So, so this would be the um, providers who are engaged with your team. Um, so that means they're, you know, coming to steering or direct line meetings, at least sometimes, um, where you go to meet with them or that sort of thing, and they're providing services uh, to your families. So, um, so go on and click on the, on the poll. We'll give everybody a few seconds. So it's just thinking about how many providers you're currently are currently involved in your start program in your county. So. Okay, so go on and put your answer in if you're if you're there. So so it's looking like um Several folks have uh, two or three uh, providers. Um, a couple of folks have one provider um, working with them in their collaborative, and a couple have um, have four or five providers, which is uh, sounds like a, a resource rich uh, kind of area. So, so good. Well, um, thanks for uh, for participating in that. Appreciate that. And um, and so moving on to a, a discussion of so who should be at the table uh, for your your start collaborative and and what do we mean by being at the table because we use that phrase a lot in start um, and it means to have a position as a member of a group that makes decisions um, so that's pretty important right to have a seat at the table um, that we're together in this endeavor that we each have a voice. And also that we each have an important role. It implies power sharing and also that we have shared goals and that we together take responsibility for the outcomes for our families. Um, so not only are we inviting providers to meetings, we're also figuring out together how we're going to do this thing called START. So you may already have, you know, a great collaborative going, or you might be, you know, kind of at the beginning. You may not have this sort of relationship yet with all the providers who could potentially serve your start clients. Um, so if that's the case, you might begin by focusing on one primary treatment provider who provides substance use disorder treatment, right? Because that's the, you know, the main focus at first is making sure there's somebody who can do substance use disorder treatment. So if you haven't done this yet, your first effort would be to recruit a partner who could do assessments and then branch out to other providers who could help with quick access to IOP, which is likely to be your most used treatment resource. Um, you might start with one IOP provider, but over time, it'll be important to develop relationships with all the IOP treatment providers in your area, as well as treatment providers who do detox, residential, outpatient counseling, medication-assisted treatment, transitional living um, or sober housing, mental health counseling, psychiatric children's services. So over time, you're really going to be developing relationships with all the treatment providers um, in your area and some outside of your area um, if you don't have those services available right in your community. So in your steering group can decide how to prioritize which treatment providers you want to reach out to next. So as we're thinking about um, engaging providers, um, and we're, if we're asking a treatment provider, uh, they'll usually tell you that they really like working with the START program, um, even though it's a lot of work and it's high expectations, right? Um, so why would they want to do all this stuff that we ask of them? Um, a lot of times treatment providers will say, you know, because we want to help people, right? We're all helpers um, when we come to this. Um, we all care about kids and families. 
Um, most behavioral health providers will tell you that it fits with their agency mission um, and that it feels good to be a part of something. Um, so as you're engaging a partner, you might be, you know, talking about how it start, you know, fits in with, uh, you know, that it's part of a national model and that, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's exciting to know that it's, uh, it's published and we're, you know, part of something bigger. Uh, and that can be, that can feel good to people. Um, also, when you're engaging treatment providers and start, it might be helpful to think about their perspective of working within a fee-for-service system. Um, and that's something that was mentioned earlier um, from Athens. Because um, if they're not doing services that are uh, paid through a fee-for-service, then they're not getting paid, right? Um, the information on this slide comes from a, health, a behavioral health provider in Indiana. And he said that when he did the math on it, he found that investing upfront in communication and participation in that initial safety meeting or initial shared decision-making meeting actually helped his bottom line because then clients were more likely to show up for their assessments and their treatment appointments. Um, and I thought that was a, a useful perspective. He talked about how much it costs his agency when clients don't show up in a fee-for-service system. Um, when they don't come for their assessments, when they don't come for their treatment appointments, the provider doesn't get paid. Um, and that's where START can be helpful. Um, because of everything that the worker and the family mentor do to help engage the parent in treatment, START clients show up more for their assessments and their treatment appointments. And that helps to generate income for the provider agency. Um, so this provider in Indiana also says that his clients do better in treatment, and he's happy to see them keeping their families intact. So that's a good thing. And he likes all the information and communication with child welfare, um, which in a lot of ways makes their job easier uh, in behavioral health. So many treatment providers say that they uh, enjoy working across systems as part of a team um, to help the success of the family. Um, so, so that was good feedback to have from them. Um, also, as you're engaging treatment providers, uh, here's some other uh, things you might tell them as you're, you know, selling selling the program to them, um, and in ways that start can be different from uh, from kind of business as usual. One being that there's, you know, so much communication with child welfare, um, way more than maybe they've experienced in the past with uh, with cases, uh, because there, you know, are so many points of, of communication along the line. Um, they might also notice that there's multiple efforts to keep the client engaged, um, that, you know, that child welfare is doing those multiple efforts, and that we're also, you know, asking the treatment provider to help us re-engage the client if they, if they drop out or if they're not doing well. There's that sense of urgency with START and that quick response to, to relapse. Um, the treatment provider wouldn't feel alone in uh, wondering what to do with this client who's, who's relapsed or has dropped out of treatment. Um, also, there's a lot of supports that can be provided by the CERT program for a client to attend treatment. Um, and that might be helping them figure out transportation or helping them uh, with uh, arranged childcare so that they're able to attend treatment or whatever else might be a barrier for them. Um, there's a whole variety of services offered. And that might be a different thing for some providers. It's not just what we're offering in-house. It's also working with, you know, multiple treatment providers, depending on what's needed for that client and other family members. And, and finally, that START really wants parents to succeed. Um, so, uh, so that's an important uh, message to give to providers, but also to let them know that sometimes it can mean, because we're offering so much up front, that sometimes these cases can move more quickly to permanency because the reasonable efforts have been established um, earlier on with all the multiple efforts that happen. So sometimes it's good to just be, you know, upfront about that as a possibility with providers. So, so okay, so time um, for us to talk some more about engaging providers. And Thomas, I said I would um, come back to you um, to uh, to talk about this. So. So thinking about, so opening up the lines again, uh, what have you guys tried that's been effective in engaging your treatment providers? Or if you're a treatment provider, what's gotten you engaged in a cross-system project? 
right. and then you know you have to. So, so as the uh, treatment provider um, here in Franklin County, um, what probably um, really helped us is the, is the teamwork between our family peer mentor, Sammy, and the uh, Franklin County Children's Service Worker, um, Paige, just really getting out there together. <laughs> By the way, isn't it? No, I'm sorry. It's somebody, somebody's not muted. I know it's somebody. If if you are, if you could mute yourself, if you're talking in the background, that would be really helpful because we've got everybody off mute now. Okay, but um, so so thank you, Thomas. So the teamwork was a was a good selling point. Sounds like. Remember what would have happened? Be going on tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I know that's distracting with the voices in the background. I don't remember. If you can hear us, please mute your line. If you're not talking. All right. So how about how about others? What have you tried that's effectively gotten um, treatment providers engaged in your start program? What's gotten them excited? So then this is Christina, and I will say one thing in Indiana that we did um, to really engage our providers early on was setting up visits, particularly with our residential and detoxification providers, um, and going out and learning more about their programs and letting them know about START and the different roles of our family mentor and our START caseworker and some of the things that may be asked of them. So that was very helpful and kind of educating ourselves on their program and letting them be educated on the STAR program. It works for the um, sort of Nice. Good idea. Good idea. Yeah, definitely going to visit can be really helpful. Yeah. I know some of the communities in Kentucky uh, would host community events for START um, and invite, you know, providers and courts and you know, schools and hospitals and whoever um, to, you know, come to the table and talk about STAR and or other important topics um, for the community can be helpful. How about others? What do you think can help engage your treatment providers? Or what, what has helped in your community? Has so anybody also, found? Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I know um, we also found that hosting community events would be helpful um, and inviting them to come to the local child welfare office and present on their program, things like that. Nice. Nice. Has anybody found that it's helpful to have a contract or an agreement? with a treatment provider? We have one with care for you. Mm. Yeah. Sounds like maybe somebody's got a, a contract. We have, this is Terry from Athens. We, we have like an MOU with um, one of the, um, you know, the, the detox, a detox um, program in another county to, you know, allow us, you know, kind of prioritize access. Um, so that's mm. nice. We haven't had, yeah. we've discussed having MOUs with other providers in, in our, you know, in our service area. We've rounded and, you know, it's probably time to do that again, you know, to bring everybody up to speed with the START program. And I feel like we have access, but we we threw around having a formal MOU, but we just never, we never did. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't know that it's really a problem. I mean, we have, we have, act, we have, act, we provide a lot of the services and we feel like, you know, obviously we, you know, we respect client choice, but it really hasn't been an issue. So um, I don't know if that's unique to our, <laughs> our area or, or what, that we just haven't really felt the need to do that. 
Mm -hmm. I wonder about other places. I, I know that um, I've seen some emails going back and forth uh, with some MOU samples. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something other counties have found useful? Yeah, here in Richland County, that's what we have um, with Family Life, um, that MOU, and that's kind of the process we're using here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you find that that's helpful to kind of knit your relationship together? Yeah, it seems to be. And, I, and again, I, I think it's kind of a learning curve for everyone involved, but um, those meetings go pretty smoothly, and just getting started, it, you know, it seems to be working pretty well for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. And when this is Marlon, and since nobody's speaking, I'll, I'll share what I've heard from some of the counties. In the very beginning with Ohio Start, um, because of our collaboration with our Attorney General's office, they put together a template, a, a model, um, MOU that PCSAs could use with their child welfare agencies um, in terms of, of getting that information. We've also had several counties that have developed their own um, agreements and MOUs also. And I've heard from counties, a lot of them already have agreements in place um, because they've already been referring people to behavioral health services. And But some of them are coming back together and revisiting those agreements that they've had and said, okay, in terms of Ohio Start, what needs to change? So I'm hearing from them that they're doing some of that, um, again, re-looking at what they have, um, what's working, and maybe what they feel like they need to add to any agreements they already have. Um, but we've encouraged them to have written MOUs and agreements, and that was part of a lot of discussions we've had actually with some of our previous TA calls with all of our agencies. Nice. Thanks, Marla. Good. And I don't know if it's helpful or not to folks, but we did provide some start-specific scope of work language. Um, there's also a, a handout, and it'll go on the um, Dropbox. If, if folks wanted to include some language like that in a um, maybe in a, an existing agreement or as they're creating new agreements. So I agree with you, Marla. I think that the um, you know contracts or agreements can be really uh, helpful for just spelling out uh, expectations and uh, kind of keeping everybody on the same page, so good, good, thanks. Well, so I also wanted to spend a minute talking about kind of a special situation, which is engaging medication-assisted treatment providers. Um, and sometimes it can be harder to, uh, to engage MAT providers at the table, um, and I'm wondering if you guys have had that experience and why you think that might be the case. By that, I mean methadone and uh, suboxone prescribers, for the most part. Has anybody found that it's harder to, uh, to engage them in conversations or communication or coming to meetings? This is Terry in Athens. Our agency provides medically assisted treatment. Not, we don't do methadone, but we do the suboxone or subuclade and um, Vivitrol. Um, and and we've also we have you know we have um, families who are you know parents who choose to go to another agency, another um, behavioral health agency in our community has rapid access, and another agency does. For, you know, prescribe all of the above, including methadone, and and I, you know, we've had a combination. Um, we, these are the same agencies that we've rounded and you know discussed to start with, but that we don't have MOUs. But it, um, you know, I feel like we have access. Um, some days mm -hmm. are better than others, but but it, I think it mm -hmm. goes reasonably well. Oh, good. I'm so glad to hear that, that that has a, and I love that you guys provide 
um, buprenorphine in house too, and Vivitrol. That's excellent. And sometimes the problem is, you know, is the there still is judgment about particular types of MAT or, or you know just difference of opinion. Um, and you know, I know that with the training of start, you know, we I mean we support the the path that uh you know, the choice of the parent on what, you know, what treatment they want, option they want to explore. But, you know, I think sometimes there's some strong opinion one way or the other. Mm -hmm. I, that's a really good point. Yeah. I, and I, I don't know if your agency ever feels this way, but sometimes the methadone or uh, buprenorphine providers will tell me they feel like the redheaded stepchild of, uh, of the substance use disorder treatment world. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're, you know, they're, they think they've been, you know, there's been a disservice done by the, you know, by the cash clinics and, you know, there is the potential for the diversion, you know, so it's, you know, you just, but it is, you know, we've had, we have many, many examples um, where it's been incredibly the right path for many people, so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm, I'm so glad you say that. Yeah. And I know sometimes, too, it can be a barrier, you know, in trying to engage a, a, the MAT providers that sometimes their hours of operation are different than everybody else's, you know, especially with the methadone clinics. They start early in the morning, and they might go home by 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so thinking about when we schedule things or when we reach out to them uh, could make a difference. Yeah. So has anybody um, found that there's something in particular that's helpful when engaging MAT providers? Because like Terry was saying, of course we want them at the table because it's an important part of evidence-based uh, approaches that we like to use and start. Hey, good morning again, everyone. This is Thomas calling up in um, Columbus and Franklin County. Um, one thing hey, that's probably... One thing that's been very helpful with um, our relationship um, with Eden Counseling Centers in um, Franklin County um, are the non-traditional hours that Eden offers um, to the clients. Um, so um, four days a week, the clinic is open until 9 p.m. Um, so I know that the uh, last doctor appointment, uh, Monday through Thursday, um, is at 7 p.m. Um, so that kind of makes a difference for as far as accessibility and, and, um, and working with clients as far as their schedules and also working with the uh, um, with the child care worker as well, too, and the family care mentor. Oh, that is so helpful. Yeah. Nice. Okay. And are, so is your... Uh, your clinic, they're a part of your collaborative? Like, do they come to steering or direct line meetings or that sort of thing, or you have good communication with them? Hey, Thomas. So, so you're the provider that you mentioned, do they um, come to your meetings and communicate well with you and that sort of thing? Maybe we've lost Thomas. Huh. So maybe he's on mute or something. All right. So, well, we're nearing the end of our time together. So. So we'll keep rolling on. Um, we've, we've already talked some about contracts and MOUs and agreements, so I'm going to roll past that. But I will share with you something that a couple of uh, providers said in Kentucky that was interesting and surprising about having an agreement or a contract. Um, and they said, if you don't mandate it, it never happens. Um, and having a contract changed our way of thinking about providing services for start clients. So um, I thought that was a really compelling um, statement. Another provider said, even though the way START operates is nailed down to a T, uh, we still felt like we were part of the negotiating process and had some say. Um, and that's what we were talking about earlier, that you know, being at the table together can be um, so important. So, so we have just a, a little more um, discussion to go, and then we're uh, going to wrap up for today. 
Um, but I wanted to, uh, to hear from you guys if you're identifying that there's any uh, services that are needed in your community, and if so, what steps do you think could be helpful for uh, developing those services? Um, and as an example, I know that in Kentucky, in some communities, they already had a full array of services, and even so, they you know work together to develop some additional. In other communities, um, maybe there wasn't a women's only intensive outpatient program, and so they had to work to set one up. Um, or maybe there weren't um, early childhood mental health services in some communities, and so the focus was on getting, uh, you know, clinicians trained up to be able to do certain EBPs, that sort of thing. So, um, so I'm wondering, once you've identified a gap in services in your community, what might you do to, to help fill that, that need? And maybe Christina can share about, I, I know in Indiana there were some gaps that, that you guys worked on as well. There was, Lynn. Um, in <laughs> our second start site, we had to do a lot of building and collaborating with our partners to um, implement some new groups. So um, really focusing in on um, gender-specific groups. So we did a women's trauma group using um, the Seeking Safety, I believe is what they implemented, as well as doing a readiness group for clients. So um, really looking at um, the information we had about our clients, what the assessments were showing us, what the population was, and then getting everyone to the table to kind of hash out the pros and cons on um, next steps and what might be implemented. So we did have to build services in Indiana. Nice. I remember you guys working working hard and, and from lots of different angles on that as well. Sometimes even looking to see, you know, is it possible to bring in a new behavioral health partner into a community? To, you know, you're providing services over here. Can you expand and provide that same service for us in this county or that sort of thing. Yeah. So, um, and we have, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say some of the work that we had to do was building the relationships between our actual providers um, so that um, it didn't feel like they were competing for referrals, but more of a collaborative relationship where they could benefit from one each other because they did have different services. Nice. That's a really good point. Yeah. I'm wondering about for others, have you identified any gaps in services in your community? This is Terry from Athens. I, you know, I think one of the things that we struggle with or that I, that I see as an overarching um, dilemma is just, you know, those sober activities or life after, you know, subsidized employment or, I mean, just something that is, that provides meaning and structure that is not necessarily treatment. Um, I, I think that's an important piece that's often, you know, um, there's just kind of a drop off, you know, get, you know, people are in crisis, mm -hmm. get them treatment. Okay, now you're well. And then there's, you know, because, I mean, you know, most of the counties that we are, you know, provide services in are, you know, pretty impoverished. And um, there's, there's mm -hmm. not necessarily a lot of you know, what I consider normative um, opportunities that are That's healthy. <laughs> um, right. And I don't know the, you know, I don't know who has the secret to that, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. What, what's someone else about to speak? Lynn, this is Marla, and I just, um, just to piggyback a little bit on what you said, um, you know, one of the things, the Child Welfare 101, what is it? Um, just to remind everybody that tomorrow, I can't, I apologize, I can't remember what county it's in, we're actually doing a Child Welfare 101, um, that we encourage your behavioral health providers to be invited to any of those coming up. I think one of the gaps that people didn't think about at first had to do, we concentrated so much on recovery services for the parents, we kind of forgot about the children's mental health. So I'm hearing people say, oh, we need to go back and think of that. So I think that's a piece that has come out that um, we figured out we're not sure where we're going. And so people are starting to look at that. 
But going, somebody had mentioned earlier the seeking safety. Um, we have a training coming up the end of April on that in uh, Ross County in southern Ohio. And another gap that people have said is around parenting, that not everybody has parenting education and skills and things. And so we have another training coming up in um, Berea the 8th, 9th, and 10th of April for people to come and learn more about how can we work with parents on sober parenting. So we're trying to, any gaps that you're saying, um, if you can send us things to say, hey, what, what do you think you have ideas, we can help share some of the ideas that other counties have come up with also. You guys have done such a nice job with that, Marla. I love that and all the great training opportunities. That's so fabulous. And you mentioned the Adam Boards earlier. So could you just say, I know we have one minute, but could you just say a bit about how those might work in terms of developing services? Oh, absolutely. We, we encourage all of our counties to contact their local Adam Boards, um, mental health and addiction services, and talk with them about sometimes we just don't, in child, in child welfare, we don't know everything that might be available. And the boards have a broader idea of things that might be happening. And so connections with those boards are so important, not just single or, or even your multiple providers, but they may have other ideas of things that they can help you say what else might be happening in the community, um, like carry out. So, you know, having those collaborations with your local mental health boards, with your family and children's first councils that may, may be aware of other, like, family activities, um, you know, all, all of those things that can be happening um, that are available in the community. So we strongly encourage any kind of relationships you can build with your local mental health boards also. And they have been informed about START. So, um, I, you know, we've heard from them. We want to know more. We want to be involved. So reach out. Oh, good, good. And maybe invite them to your steering meeting. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, oh, that, absolutely. I strongly encourage that. Yeah, yeah. So, well, good. I know we're at the end of our time, so um, there's lots of resources uh, on the at the end of the webinar if you care to look at those. And after a while, they could be helpful in your site. And um, we didn't have a chance to ask uh, Jen Foley to talk about community mapping, but that's a resource that um, she can help counties with if they want some help kind of determining if there are gaps in services in their community. So thank you so much to everybody for um, participating today, and uh, especially those who shared um, on the line or in the chat. And uh, we will talk to you later. Thank you, CFF, for, for doing, hosting you. this today.